Dr. Shibu Bule, uh, who will be talking on uh, their experiences with IONM in brain and spine surgery. So we are very grateful for having them on board. And uh, first, uh, Dr. Ali Asghar will start with his uh, experience on uh, INM and supratendural tumor surgery. So uh, let me introduce you all to Dr. Ali Asghar. So Dr. Ali Asghar is a professor and chief neurosurgery at Tata Hospital, Mumbai, Tata Memorial Hospital. Uh, he has done his neurosurgical training from Nimhans, Bangalore in 2005. And uh, he has been instrumental in establishing neuro onco services in PMC. So uh, it's one of the very few neurosurgical departments in India who focuses exclusively on neuro oncology. Uh, his keen interests are in um, intraoperative imaging and also on in intraoperative brain mapping, uh, which includes awake surgery. And uh, this is also the topic for today, where he'll be speaking about brain mapping and supratendural tumor resection. He'll be talking about cortical and subcortical uh, mapping and monitoring methods. So uh, he has, uh, two years ago, he has published a paper on dynamic mapping uh, with, uh, in the Tata group, um, which talks about methods of monitoring in uh, uh, cortical and subcortical uh, tumor resection. Uh, he has more than 100 peer-reviewed uh, publications uh, besides that, so in many of the neurosurgical journals. So he is also tumor resection editor for World Neurosurgery, which is one of the leading neurosurgical journals. And he's on editorial board of many, many other neurosurgical journals. He's also a member of WFNS Technology Committee. So I, uh, so it's, it's been now, I think, more than seven years uh, when Tata is doing uh, neuro monitoring in brain and spine surgery, even more than that, because I was fortunate enough to get in touch with Sir and support him for few surgeries. So I know so personally, and I feel he's one of the very few neurosurgeon who apart from being pioneered the skills in neurosurgery, he is also an excellent, he has also an excellent knowledge on neurophysiology, which is pretty rare uh, when a neurosurgeon is equally good in neurophysiology aspects. So we are fortunate to have him and uh, share his experience with all of us. So over to you, sir, um, looking forward to learn. Uh, also, if anyone has any questions, they can just write in the chat box. Uh, for giving a better audio experience, we are muting everyone. Um, so you can either write in the chat box or either raise your hand. Uh, at the end of the session, we'll be having 15 minutes question answers where we'll moderate the questions from the audience and so can give the answer, right? So thank you and so please start. Okay. Um... Thank you, Ankit, for that uh, flattering introduction. I'm just checking if everybody can hear me. Yes, sir, I think we can hear you. Okay, fine. All right, so uh, thank you, uh, Ankit, and uh, thank you, everyone, for coming the webinar. It's a bit of webinars these days, and I just hope uh, all of us uh, learn from this webinar something to take home together. And uh, before I start off, wish you all uh, a safe and healthy time ahead in these days. So uh, um, Ankit mentioned that I will be talking about supratentorial uh, tumor surgery, and I'm going to be specifically talking on motor mapping and monitoring in supratentorial tumor surgery, because um, other aspects of awake speech and cognitive function mapping might take longer, and maybe that would need another webinar. So I'm going to focus on motor mapping and monitoring. Now, uh, when we talk of tumors of the uh, intraaxial tumors of the brain, uh, essentially these tumors uh, arise within the subcortical white matter, and they involve uh, cortical and subcortical areas of the brain, which uh, can be potentially eloquent. Now, if you extrapolate the definition of eloquent, it could involve the entire brain. When you talk about motor eloquent tumors, uh, we are restricting ourselves to a certain area of the brain. The question is, we know the cortical anatomy, we know the subcortical anatomy in the books, but how do you translate that into the operating theater? When we are operating in the theater, it's uh, always a challenge to understand where these tumors are with respect to these areas. Now, 
difficult to put in the figure, but motor eloquent tumors usually constitute around 40% of most intraaxial tumor series. And uh, these tumors are a challenge because they are one in three tumors that you would be operating, gliomas. And at the same time, there is a significant source of morbidity because of injury to the motor areas and specifically the subcortical motor tracts. And hence, protecting these during surgery is important. On the one hand, you want to remove these tumors, maximize the resection. And at the same time, you also want to ensure that the morbidity is minimized. Now, when we talk of mechanical injury, it could be at the cortical level and it could be at the subcortical level. At the cortex, we see that we know there is a homunculus and that depending on which part of the convexity you are operating, certain areas of the brain are more at risk. As you go further down into the subcortical matter, the injury could happen anywhere. And as you realize that the pyramidal tracts and the fibers converge towards the internal capsule, and therefore the deeper you go, the denser and more complete the deficits start happening. The challenge is not only the mechanical injury, but the vascular injury that you are likely to impart on the patient in case of damage to certain end vessels, and more specifically, certain named perforators like the lenticular stride vessels, like for example, in insular tumors. And you must also remember that these deficits can occur even when you're operating remote from the site of the corticospinal tract itself. Classically in insular tumors, you are nowhere close to the corticospinal tract, but if you damage the lenticular stride, you will have a hemiplegia. So this is the anatomical substrate of motor tumors and what are the potential sources of injuries, mechanical and vascular. Now, how do we go about dealing with these tumors and routine neurosurgical practice? Yes, we know, we know the functional anatomy, we assess the pre-op MRIs and judge where the cortical and subcortical location of the tumor would be. But mind you, there is always anatomical variability. And therefore, most of us, including me, we would do some kind of preoperative functional imaging. That could be a functional MRI, which looks for cortical function. It could be a diffusion tensor imaging with tractography for the subcortical fibers. And nowadays you have newer techniques like TMS and MEG, which tell you cortical and subcortical function even more reliably. However, these have a limitation, and the limitations are related to the technique per se, as well as the individual operator dependence. And therefore, there is a lot of discordance between the results of these techniques and actual intraoperative stimulation mapping results. The discordance is less for motor mapping and monitoring and much more for other functions of the brain. Therefore, these techniques are useful. They should be used and they should be used more as a guide rather than relying blindly on them. And why do I say that? Here's a paper to describe what is the concept of presumed eloquence? Now, when we look at a tumor, we base our decision whether this is eloquent or non-eloquent on the MRI and the functional imaging that we obtain. So in this study, what the authors did is that they took all tumors that they had operated over a period of time, and they defined them as eloquent or non-eloquent based on this preoperative MRI. They had one group which they said they were non-eloquent, they had one group which they said they had eloquent tumors based on preoperative imaging. Amongst the eloquent, they had operated some tumors without any mapping. So that's the second row that there was no mapping eloquent tumors. Amongst the other eloquent tumors and some of the non-eloquent, they used mapping. And in those patients in which they used mapping, they were further able to tease out from the eloquent tumors, the presumed eloquent tumors, the truly eloquent and the truly non-eloquent tumors. And this is what the third and the fourth row are. So when they presumed the tumor was eloquent preoperatively, but on intraoperative mapping, it came out to be non-eloquent, they called it false eloquent. And if you see of the presumed eloquent 125 odd, almost a third of them were actually not eloquent when they really mapped the tumor. And why is that important? As I said, this was the group which was mapped. Now, if you look at the hazard ratios, this is the survival values in the group which was really non-eloquent and the one in which they had thought they would be eloquent, but by mapping, they proved that it was non-eloquent. They were almost the same, which means when you really have non-eloquent area tumors, 
because you're able to probably remove them better, they have better survivors. And on the contrary, the ones which were truly eloquent, that is, they thought they were eloquent on pre-op MRI and they mapped and they confirmed that they had very high hazard ratios, which means survivals were poor. And this is again, obviously, because of the lower extent of resection. But look what happened to the group in which they did not map. These were the ones they thought that it could be eloquent and did not map, and their hazard ratios are poor, which means that they behave like truly eloquent tumors. You might say that, so what, they were eloquent. But if you look at the results closely, if they had mapped this group, they would have been able to tease out the true eloquent and the non-eloquent tumors from there. Almost a third of them would have probably been non-eloquent, and the survivals would have been far better than what the whole group eventually had. And what does this translate into? This translates into that if you do not map and do not confirm the eloquence, you are likely to compromise the overall results, outcomes, oncological outcomes of these patients. And therefore, in any patient which has a presumed eloquent tumor, intraoperative confirmation is essential. How do you do that intraoperative confirmation? Well, there are two aspects to intraoperative confirmation of eloquence. One is, first of all, to identify the functional area, which means where the motor areas are, be it cortex or subcortical. And the second is where or how the tracks are. And how the tracks are depends on the integrity of the entire corticospinal tract. Now, if the entire corticospinal tract is at risk, you need to monitor it in its entirety. And this is what monitoring does. It is done usually in a continuous manner, and it can help you detect ongoing vascular as well as mechanical injuries. Whereas mapping is usually interrupted. You do it interrupted in a punctiform manner, and it helps you preempt usually only the mechanical injury. So what is the use of mapping? Mapping helps you pick up where the motor areas are. Even in series in which people have extensively mapped tumors, there is always a risk of motor deficits. And why does that happen? Because in a small percentage of these cases, the motor deficit is picked up, even by the IONM, much later than after it has occurred. And this is essentially because of the interrupted nature of mapping. So when you map, you try and look for an eloquent area, you find there's nothing, you go ahead and resect, and then you map again. In between two mappings, you are likely to have already caused injury. And therefore, this has evolved into a concept of continuous mapping as well as monitoring, and that's what we are going to be talking about. Now, if you have to reliably map important to be able to remove the tumor as far as possible. That means you need to get as close to the motor tracks as possible. It has to be with reasonable safety. That means you have to be able to judge the distance from where your resection is to the motor areas. And you should be able to also predict the consequence of damaging those tracks, whether it's going to be reversible or irreversible. So is this all guesswork? Well, actually, it's not really guesswork, but it's calculated guesswork. It's calculated risks that you take, and you base them on elaborate intraoperative monitoring feedback. And this is the concept of mapping as well as monitoring. Now, when you talk of mapping itself, there are two ways of doing the mapping. You can do that under asleep conditions, that is with general anesthesia. And what we do there is we give a controlled electrical stimulus. And this is recorded in the form of an electrical event. It's essentially for motor and sensory uh, functions. Whereas when you do it awake, you again use an electrical stimulus, but you're able to map almost any function of the brain which you want. In a sleep or on the GA, you need a good neuroanesthetist, of course, but you also need an expert neurophysiologist or a neurotechnologist, especially if you're going to do complicated mapping techniques. Whereas in awake, you would preferably require support from a neuropsychologist because of higher cognitive and speech mapping uh, paradigms that are used. The machines are a little different, though some machines like this one can do everything. But for doing MEP monitoring and mapping, you need a little more elaborate setup. And for doing awake, uh, you would uh, get away with doing bipolar mapping using an Ohmann or a modified Ohmann stimulator. 
if we restrict ourselves to motor in awake and in asleep patients, uh, the interpretation in awake patients is usually done in the form of observing a tonic movement. Though you could put some electrodes, but what you get is not uh, MEP, you would get a, a bizarre compound motor action potential. Whereas in asleep patients, we use a train of stimulus, which we will discuss, and you record what is called as a motor evoked potential. And in asleep, it's essentially the same responses. The only difference being that the current levels are higher in the asleep patient. One of the most important aspects of motor mapping is identifying the motor sulcus, the central sulcus, and the motor area or the M1. And this is done by the technique of phase reversal. When we say phase reversal, it's a somatosensory evoked potential technique which is used to identify the location of the central sulcus in an indirect manner, which means that over here you have the central sulcus and you have the motor area in front of it and the sensory area behind. If you were to pass a strip across that and stimulate one of the peripheral sensory nerves to generate a somatosensory evoked potential, what you would get is a classical response in the primary sensory area, which is the N20 response over here. And exactly across, you would get a mirror image in the primary motor area, which is the P20 wave. This is the reversal of the phase that you look for. And then you decide that this, this is the central sulcus between the two electrodes. Once you have confirmed the location, you can do a direct confirmation by doing direct motor mapping or cortical mapping. It's generally done with a handheld uh, monopolar stimulator, which is ball tip to protect the cortex. And you have to remember that the polarity for stimulation is different for cortex and for subcortical. It's anodal for cortical and cathodal for subcortical. The current stimulation intensities range from one to 20 milliamps, depending on various uh, situations. And you always use a train we use a train of five with a frequency, it's a high frequency between 250 to 350, 333 hertz. And you have to record the evoke potentials from the different muscles. Now this is important. This is the kind of muscles that we use it to respond, uh, to pick up the responses from. I remember that most of the motor cortex or most of the tumors in the uh, supratentorial are on the convexity. And the large part of the motor cortex in the convexity is the upper limb and little more laterally the face. So we usually record a lot of MEPs from the upper limb and face. To record an MEP from the lower limb is sometimes difficult and you need to stipulate a little more higher up or on the medial aspect. But depending on which area you're operating, you have to monitor the appropriate muscle. The advantage of doing motor mapping with monopolar is that you are able to record an MEP. And recording an MEP is a time-locked constant response, which means it occurs at a fixed time, which is called the latent period. It has an amplitude, which is measurable, and it has a waveform, which is interpretable. And this is important because a lot of the clinical decisions the amplitude and changes in the morphology. You will not get this response when you do an awake patient with bipolar stimulation because you don't record an MEP then. You record a motor unit action potential, a compound action potential. It does not have a latency. There is no way to measure an amplitude. In addition, in monopolar mapping with the patient and anesthesia, you obviously don't need the patient awake, so you don't need patient compliance. Mind you, we are talking about monitoring the motor function here. It does not cause patient movement except if you use very high levels of current stimulation. It is less focal than bipolar, and this may be a disadvantage, but it is an advantage when we talk of dynamic subcortical mapping, and we'll see why that is the case. By reducing your intensity in the cortical level, you are able to reduce the focal zone of stimulation, and you're able to localize even cortical structures much more better. As I said, the same paradigms of mapping can be used for MEP monitoring with the strip, and we'll again have a look at that subsequently. And one of the benefits of doing MEP monitoring during motor tumor surgeries is to be able to differentiate between M1 or primary motor area injury versus supplementary motor area injury or the negative motor networks, which we will also talk about soon. 
The disadvantages is that this kind of MEP monitoring sometimes requires technical uh, finesse. You need to have a good neurotechnologist or a neurophysiologist who's able to help you with that. We are fortunate to have a very good neurophysiologist, but a trained neurotechnologist would definitely help you in troubleshooting and actually minimizing your false positives and false negatives, which is very important. Otherwise, you will be misled into either over-resecting and causing more damage or under-resecting when you get false positive warning signs. One of the other advantages of using monopolar, as I already said, is that because it is less focal, it spreads. And the current spread has been measured across many series using navigated uh, techniques. And that what is found is that the distance of the corticospinal tract from the tip of the stimulator is directly proportional to the intensity of the stimulus, which means that if you have a higher stimulus, the current is going to spread much deeper and is going to stimulate something at a much deeper level. And that spread is directly proportional to the stimulus. And how that is exploited, this is seen in many other studies also. And based on all these studies, uh, a basic formula of one milliamp intensity of stimulation to one millimeter of distance has been has come out, which is what is used clinically. Now, mind you, this is a rough formula. When you use it, you always interpret that carefully along with all the other intraoperative tools and intraoperative judgment that you need to make. But this is a very reliable formula to use in subcortical mapping. So we do in subcortical mapping. For example, in tumors like this, what you're interested in is that where the motor tracts will be at the periphery. And as you go through the tumor, sometimes you're underestimating the depth of the tumor and you might hit motor areas even before you know them. So what is done is that you use what we call is the suction monopolar. And the suction monopolar is this tube suction tube, which is insulated except at the tip, which serves as the monopolar stimulator. It's connected to the stimulating port of the uh, device, and it delivers the monopolar current. The current that you set for delivery depends on where you want to start stimulating from. So if we start at, say, 10 milliamps, and you try and record the MEP, and you don't get any MEP, that means that the corticospinal tract is not within 10 millimeters of this stimulating electrode. So you have a 10 millimeter window which you can resect further. And therefore you resect, you increase the current to 15, and lo, if you get a response, you know that the corticospinal tract is now 15 millimeters away from your tip. That means it was not at 10, but it is at 15, which means it's between 10 and 15. And then you start resecting layer by layer and reducing to a point where you can reach almost one or two millimeters close to the corticospinal tract. And when I say one or two millimeters close to the corticospinal tract, you must remember that the formula one millimeter for one milliamp is valid for most of the distances, but the closer you get to two or three millimeters, the more inaccurate this formula becomes. So when you reach close to three millimeters or three milliamps, you have to be very careful. You have to judge based on many other things, including continuous MEP monitoring, and we will see that again. Now, this is just a video to show you how that would work. So here you have uh, the tumor. This is the bed. We have resected part of it, and uh, we use a suction monopolar tube. Now the suction monopolar is coming into the picture. And here you have the MEPs which are continuously uh, running. Now the MEPs which are running here, this is the suction monopolar. This is the current we are stimulating. At the moment we touch, you can see that there are MEPs which come up and these are all the upper limb MEPs as well as some lower limb, which means that our current is either too strong and that we are 15 millimeters away from the uh, corticospinal tract and it is stimulating all the fibers of the corticospinal tract. We can decide whether this is tumor that needs to be resected based on other techniques of imaging. And if it has to be resected, we know we have a 15 millimeter margin which we can resect. And we do that, we reduce from 15 to 14 to 13 to 12, and then go on that way depending on where the tumor is. However, as I said, it's not just enough to do the mapping. And why is that? I already talked about it. If you were operating a tumor close to the insula, 
you may be far away from the motor tracts or you may be far away from the cortex, but you're still very close to these vascular supply, which may actually be the ones which cause the hemiplegia. And vascular injury usually can be abrupt and may be irreversible in a lot of the cases, but it is reversible if picked up early. And that is where continuous monitoring and MEP helps. So MEP may not be able to eliminate all the deficits which occur because of ischemia. But in two third cases, is dropped because of vascular insult. You may be able to traverse them by many techniques, by stopping, by irrigating, by raising the mean arterial pressure, by using papaverine, and then coming back and going ahead with your surgery. How is monitoring done? Now, monitoring, as I said, gives you an idea of the integrity of the entire tract. You stimulate the cortical neurons. You can do that transcranially as well as directly. We'll see that. And you record the volley which follows that through the pyramidal neurons into the spinal cord. It can be recorded from the spinal cord. And when you do that directly, it's a neurogenic MEP, which is a D wave. And what we record from muscles are muscle evoke motor evoke potentials or compound motor action potentials. And this figure shows you what we do for transcranial MEPs. Now, transcranial MEP means we fix these corkscrew electrodes on the scalp of the patient. And this is according to the International 1020 uh, classification of EEG. You place them at C3, C4, or CZ is the reference. We use a high frequency paradigm for stimulation using a train of four stimuli. And these are the parameters for that. This is what the neurophysiologist and the neurotechnologist would do. We record from the different muscles. And we, this image here shows you the different waveforms from different muscles. Now, these are the muscles. These are the amplitude of the individual MEPs. And you can, latencies of each of the MEP differ because you would have MEPs which come from porticospinal tracts going to the tibialis anterior will take much longer whereas those going to the facial muscles will be much smaller and those going to the upper limb would be intermediate. But for that particular muscle, the latency is almost always constant and that is one of the benefits of the MEP. On the other hand, cortical MEP is done by putting in a strip across the motor cortex. And what we do in my practice is that we usually don't do phase reversal for localizing the motor cortex. We directly put in the strip and we uh, try and find out one of the contact electrodes which is active and using the same MEP uh, paradigms as for transcranial as well as for motor mapping with monopolar, we stimulate that and slightly keep moving the strip in and out. And the point at which we get the best corticospinal tract motor evoke potential, we fix that as the point at which we will record the MEPs. Now the MEPs are again recorded from these muscles but there is a difference in the MEP recorded from transcranial and from the direct cortical. And why is that so? Now, when we are recording from transcranial, this is 3C, C3, C4, you see that the electrodes are a little lateral. Also, that the currents that I use are much higher. And that's the reason why they use is higher is because they have to penetrate the cortex, the skull, and then they have to reach and stimulate the corticospinal neurons, which means that the currents that go in will stimulate the corticospinal tracts much deeper and usually at the level of the corona radiata or the internal capsule depending on the current strength. Whereas when we use a grid stimulation or a strip, we are stimulating very focally. The currents that we use are much lesser, less than 20 milliamps, and they will cause a focal stimulation. So if you were operating a tumor over here in the cortical, in the supratentorial compartment, and if you had used only transcranial, you would have continued to get all intact transcranial MEPs because these are stimulating the corticospinal tracts much below the place at which you are operating and would bypass the site of injury. Whereas if you use corticostrip MEPs, you're likely to pick up the damage and the integrity much better. But one of the fallacies of a direct strip MEP is that uh, excuse this, this is my own diagram. But if you look at the cortex, you can see that the homunculus is spread out at the cortex. The further you go away from the center of the brain, the motor strip fans out. And therefore, if you're operating somewhere here, you need to understand that the cortical MEP, which you are generating and monitoring is going to come from just one or two groups of muscles. And therefore, 
depending on which fibers are going to be close to the motor tumor or the area that you are operating, that is the group of muscles that is important to monitor. So if you're operating more laterally, it's the face and the upper limb muscles that you have to make sure you get MEPs from. Whereas if you're operating more superiorly or medially, and the lower limb and some upper limb fibers are important, and therefore you monitor those muscles with the strip. This is important to understand, otherwise you will get false positives and false negatives. Now, if done properly, and this is uh, what is there in literature, for supratorial tumors, you have very good sensitivity and specificity and good negative predictive values. And what does that mean? It means that when you have normal or you don't have any warning signs with the MEPs, you are not likely to get any deficits. It's a very good reassurance that everything is okay, we can go ahead. But when you get a warning sign, the positive predictive value is around two thirds, which means in one third of the cases, you get false positives. And this is important, it is known, it is not completely avoidable, and it is better to get false positives and err on the side of not causing a deficit than getting false negatives and going ahead and operating and causing a deficit. So this is important to remember when you are working with a neurophysiologist or when you are working with team, because the alteration has to be taken by the surgeon. So the benefit of monitoring in addition to mapping is you have a continuous monitoring of the integrity, you have preservation of MEPs, that is negative value is 100%. And it gives you readouts which you can act on online real time during the surgery. Remember for vascular deficits, one thirds of the times they may be irreversible. You may get a drop in MEP, but before you can do anything, it's not possible to reverse it. But you should still try because two thirds of the times when that happens, you are able to reverse the deficit. And it's important to listen to the neurophysiologist or your neurophysiological team and set warning criteria for yourself. In our experience, we've used this technique of strip MEPs as well as subcortical and cortical mapping using direct monopolar. What we have, uh, so this is uh, what we do. And what we did is we modified the dynamic mapping technique, which was uh, described by uh, the Burn group. And uh, we adapted it to our setup. Uh, what we did was, uh, now we've operated around 140, 150 cases using this technique. But uh, a couple of years back, we analyzed our initial experience with the first 40 cases we did. And these were all motor eloquent tumors where we used cortical subcortical mapping and we attempted to do MEP monitoring. Now we were able to get transcranial MEPs in all these patients. It's usually never a problem getting transcranial MEPs. However, we were able to get the cortical strip MEPs in uh, around 75% of these patients. And that's because uh, it's sometimes difficult to move the strip, especially into the motor area. And at other times, it, especially in recurrent tumors, you have a lot of adhesions and therefore you're not able to use a strip. Another problem with strip is, and this you should be aware of, is that as the brain moves and sags, sometimes the strip gets displaced and you might think you've lost the MEP. So it's very important when you're operating to keep the strip always on the motor area. Now in these 40 patients, we had two patients with new transient postoperative deficits, and they were because of a reversible loss of direct cortical strip MEP, and one case in which there was a reversible loss of the transcranial MEP. In that case, we had not been able to get direct cortical strip MEPs. And both of these were transient and they improved at one month follow-up. There were no permanent motor deficits, and all of these were tumors around motor eloquent areas. And we had a radical resection rate, complete plus near total in 75% of them. Just to illustrate a couple of those cases, this is one case on the right non-dominant uh, parietal lobe, perirolandic, but in the parietal lobe area, we can see here that the motor strip is displaced anteriorly. Incidentally, there's a small meningioma that this patient also had, and this was on T2, uh, and with minimal enhancement in the center. It looked like a transformed glioma. So we did functional MRI and it showed some areas which lit up. I'm sorry for that. Uh, with, I think I skipped the slide somewhere. So the functional MRI also showed a few areas lighting up behind the tuber and it looked like it had spread out the motor strip around it. So intraoperatively, we used both strip and transcranial MEP. So transcranial MEP, as you can see, 
and these are the baseline strip MEPs. We concentrated more on the upper limb fibers, as you can see here. And at the end of surgery, we had a 20% increase in the threshold, which is fine. This is okay. This is what the resection cavity looked like. I have a video I will run you through, but just to give you an idea that this was the, I'm sorry, but the cursor seems to give me trouble. So this is where we got these positive responses at 15 milliamps as we were operating. And over here, we had lower limb responses at 10 milliamps. And uh, this was the pre-op and the post-op. Now this is the video and I will kind of run you through this slowly. So what we do is that as soon as you open, we identify the tumor and we pass in this strip. Now the strip, as you can imagine, is anterior. The motor area is anterior. So I just slide it in anteriorly and I start the monitoring MEP continuously and move the strip gently in and out till I get a positive response at which point of time I whether this is a consistent response by slightly increasing the stimulus intensity of the MEP and then fix it once it is consistent. Having done that, using your navigation or your ultrasound or MRI, you find out how much is the uh, tumor that you are going to resect, your boundary. In this case, the tumor was obviously evident and we decided to go ahead with that. This was the strip MEP that we did at baseline. Once you get a baseline, it's always it's important to always get a baseline MEP because that is what you base all your subsequent comparison on. Once you have that constant, you can evidence your respect. We generally follow a policy of doing an end block resection cell. So we would go, we would move that, and we are. I'm going to skip the video. Hello? Yeah, am I audible? So you're audible. Okay. Uh, the voice is flickering in between, I think, because of connection, but otherwise you're audible. Okay, is it is it okay now? Yeah, yeah okay. now it's okay, sir. Yeah, yeah so uh, at this point of time, uh, this is where we were doing the anterior part close to the motor area, and we are using the suction monopolar continuously trying to separate it off the bank of the sulcus. We use it as a normal suction. And in the depths in the white matter, we are going to be using that for doing the stimulation and repairing the MEPs. Now, as you keep doing that, you do it circumferentially. You do the subpoil resection, and this is what we are doing posteriorly. We are separating the, sulc the entire gyrus, which is involved by tumor. And at this point of time, we are not really mapping but we've kept the MEP monitoring on continuously. When I say continuously, it means that we are doing it uh, in, a, in a short burst, but you don't keep it running continuously during your surgery, otherwise you'll have seizures. So you run it at times when you think it's critical or you want to check, but it's always going on in the background when you are doing some other part of your surgery, even when you're not mapping. And at the depth, when you're removing the tumor, you're going to be start doing the subcortical mapping and this is what we are doing. So here we are doing the subcortical mapping. We are dissecting the tumor off. And if you can see that we are even sparing those vessels, these small vessels in the depth are important because they may be uh, uh, vessels which are going en route to other parts and especially anteriorly to the cortex of the motor strip, which is something which you have to preserve Frequently damage or you compress this vessel, you will promptly have a drop in your MEP, which you know at that point of time you've done something wrong, and you go back, check whether you have a retractor there, whether you have put cotton pledge it onto that vessel, and you can reverse those changes. <coughs> and then you go ahead, and I'm not going to go through the entire video, and you keep doing the subcortical mapping, and you use that at points in the subcortical plane even which may not appear to be close to motor radius because you don't know how the splayed motor fibers are going to be in the three-dimensional space of your surgical cavity. Towards the end, I do the mapping even more frequently and keep reducing the current so that you go closer and closer. Once you've done that, you decide if this needs to be removed further based on your intraoperative imaging, ultrasound, or any other technique. And before you go ahead and remove that, you check with your mapping how far or how close you are from the subcortical fibers. 
This was the post-op uh, MRI. You can see we've got a complete resection and it was very close to the motor area, the primary motor area here with the hand knob. And these are uh, the different post-operative MRIs. This is another case. Now this case is a very small tumor and this tumor seems to be lying within the motor strip. Uh, we were not really sure, I must admit, preoperatively whether it's within the motor area or it's close to it, but it looked to be involving the M1 area. And this was the functional MRI, which uh, we appear to say that the tumor over here is being enveloped by the functioning motor areas. Now, this case illustrates the concept of presumed eloquence that I mentioned. When we actually did the case and we mapped and we did a cortical mapping, what we realized, you know, this is posterior, this is anterior, that the M1 was quite anterior to the tumor and that the tumor was actually not an M1, but it was a primary sensory area, S1 tumor. That means we were pretty safe and we could resect this tumor and remove it postoperatively. You can now see better that the M1 or the motor strip is actually was compressed significantly by the edema and therefore appeared, I mean, it seemed to give an appearance that it was being involved by the tumor, but because we confirmed it intraoperatively, we were able to safely remove it. Because of the edema and the handling, of course, the patient had transient worsening. And you must remember that when you're operating close to these areas, there is going to be transient worsening. But as long as your MEPs were intact, I told you, the negative predictive value is very good. You're not going to have any long-term deficits most of the times. And this patient actually improved by post-op day eight, and he was absolutely fine. So when you're doing tumors around the motor area, to reiterate, you need to identify the functional area, which means you need to map, but also you need to ensure the integrity throughout. And this is a combination of mapping and monitoring. Even when you do that, there are instances where you may have problems. Now, this is a case where we've done, uh, looks like a premotor area tumor. We've resected it, we used MEP, it was all fine. However, the patient postoperatively. <laughs> So you see, he's, he's got uh, echinacea, he's not even talking. This is a dominant area, and uh, this is a classical supplementary motor area syndrome. And even after two weeks, postoperatively, he seemed to have these deficits, which is known with submotical area. Now, when this happens, and I'm going to skip it, this is one of the limitations. So when you have MEP monitoring, everything is fine. You still have a possibility that you will have deficits. And we need to understand this concept motor areas, which is important. So in this case, of course, it was in Broadman area six, and this is classically the paper which described the supplementary motor area syndrome. And that is because the supplementary motor is a modulating motor network area. It's a nodal area for modulating motor activity. And on the dominant side, that is the left side, it even modulates speech. And it is connected at the subcortical level with the basal ganglia, that is caudate nucleus, as well as the inferior frontal gyrus through the frontostriatal tract, frontal aslan tract. And these cannot be mapped or monitored using monocolor under awake where you have to assess not only the motor, but also the motor speech component. And this is what we call and describe as the negative motor response mapping. It is important. Uh, there are two schools of thought. Some people would say that supplementary motor area syndrome recovers and therefore can be removed. Yes, it recovers in most of the instances, but fine motor activity can be compromised for, for a long period of time, even permanently in a lot of the cases. And depending on the patient's profession, you may want to counsel the patient and decide whether you want to accept that long-term deficit. If you are accepting it, then under anesthesia, MEP monitoring is a very good tool because as long as the MEPs are intact, you will not have any primary motor deficits, even though the patient wakes up with a hemiplegia because of a supplementary motor syndrome. However, if you have to map the secondary motor areas and supplementary motor is one such area, you have to do that awake and you have to do that by using complex motor tasks, which is either bimanual alternating tasks or using some kind of uh, instruments like the Praxis uh, testing egg board, which is a, a tapping board or a hand manipulation task. 
and you use the bipolar paradigm, which is the Penfield paradigm, and you look for the arrest of the movement during surgery. It's a negative motor phenomenon, and that's why it's called negative motor mapping. To summarize, uh, MEPs monitoring and mapping are extremely useful, and they are actually, I would say, standard of care when you're operating in the perirolandic area. Monitoring is equally important, and you have to remember that just mapping and not monitoring is not going to give you optimal results. Both of them have limitations when it comes to complex motor tasks, and if you have to map and preserve them, then monopolar is not the technique. You have to do them awake with bipolar technique. Of course, as with everything in neurosurgery, experience and expertise matters. And as you do more and more of these and do them correctly, you're likely to improve your results eventually. Thank you very much. Thank you for your patient sharing. And I hope I have not exceeded my time. I think you were perfect on the time. And uh, it was a very interesting session and one of the very useful topic because it's like many people ask about techniques of monitoring and mapping in the superintendent field. So uh, I think uh, with us, there are many stalwarts in the audience of, for neuromonitoring. Uh, there are also participants from neurophysiology, neuroanesthesia, etc. background. So I would like to invite uh, Professor Ashok Jareal, who is a senior neurophysiologist. He's a professor in clinical neurophysiology from Ames, Delhi. And uh, he has the maximum experience, more than 11 years of experience in IOM now uh, in India. And he has been pioneer and, you know, starting neuro monitoring in Ames, Delhi. So, sir, can you please uh, moderate these sessions on question answers and uh, help us out? Hello. Uh, hello, sir. Are you there with us? I think I think uh, sir cannot hear us. Uh, may I request uh, May I request Dr. Nitin Manohar to please help us with moderating the session. So, Dr. Nitin Manohar is senior neuroanesthetist from uh, Yashoda, Hyderabad. And uh, he is working with Dr. Anand, and he is an expert neuromonitoring. He has been there, and he has given many sessions and lectures, and uh, he has been in part of many neuromonitoring societies. So, uh, Furkan, if you can unmute Dr. Nitin Manoha. Hi, uh, can you hear me, Ankit? Yeah, yes, sir, we can hear you, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, uh... It was a wonderful lecture, uh, Dr. Ali, and uh, uh, I mean, eye-opening for uh, many of us uh, who are doing intraoperative neuromonitoring, and I think this is up to the next level what you are uh, doing there. So, uh, some questions what the audience want to know about is about negative motor mapping. How do you do it? Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, uh, Nitin, thank you. Um, so, you know, as I said, when we say negative motor mapping, generally when we do motor mapping with the stimulation, what we are looking for is a positive response, a positive phenomenon. That's what we are trying to pick up, the primary motor areas. So when you stimulate, you expect a movement, either you see the movement or you record it with an MEP. However, when we talk of the associated motor areas or the secondary motor areas, which are the modulating networks, what they do is that they feed into the primary motor area and they do that by a combination of different modulatory stimuli, positive, negative. The net result is that they coordinate a series of motor activity. So when you stimulate these networks, you will not get a 
direct stimulation in the form of a positive response from the motor neurons. But if you set in motion a complex activity, like it need not be complex, complex, but it could be a repetitive movement of the hand or opening of fingers and closing them alternately, this kind of coordinated activity puts into action the supplementary motor networks. And if you stimulate them, suddenly there will be a stop in this activity or it may become clumsy or less coordinated. And this is how it's a negative response that you look for and that is how you interpret the presence of these negative motor networks. And you can only do that if the patient is awake and cooperative and therefore it can be done only in the awake patient and with a bipolar paradigm because the monopolar stimulation paradigm does not as it does not even with speech and other cognitive function induce a negative response. Yeah, I mean, I hope that was... Uh, I, yeah, yeah, that was uh, very fine, sir. That was very well explained. So the problem comes in when the SMA is involved. That's, uh, that's what we understand. And uh, once the SMA area is involved, it probably becomes more important to do it awake. That's what you mean? And by doing this negative motor mapping? So it depends. As I said, uh, if you have a high-grade glioma in that area, yes. you, want yes. to you want to remove that tumor, and you have to be able to counsel the patient that... Uh, Postoperatively, there is a high chance that you will have a supplementary motor area syndrome. In such cases, uh, you may be lucky if you do not get a complete or a dense deficit, especially in the non-dominant side, but it is a risk taken. In low-grade tumors, you have the choice of offering the patient long-term rehabilitation, which high-grade glioma patients may not have. Also, in low-grade glioma patients, they are younger, they may be more in their productive life, and they may want to exercise the option of not having that deficit. In which case, if you don't, then you need to stop the surgery when you start getting these responses. Now, when we say that you're going to remove the supplementary motor area tumor, as I talked about presumed eloquence, Having a tumor in the anatomical supplementary motor area, Broadman 6, does not necessarily mean that those fibers are going to be involved. So you may be able to remove a tumor which is anatomically in the supplementary motor area region without getting the supplementary motor area syndrome. Most of the times you induce the deficits because you dissect around and sometimes you dissect a little indiscriminately even when you use MEPs because you are not able to pick up those fibers. By doing the patient awake, you are in addition to the primary motor fibers able to identify those networks which you can choose to leave intact if you have the patient's uh, instructions for that, or you have the choice of removing that if you have discussed with the patient that yes, we will remove the negative motor fibers, but positive motor fibers will be present and therefore you will recover eventually, but it may take time and that may be unpredictable. So that is the difference between doing it. It's all eventually balancing outcomes and especially in low-grade gliomas, it's a lot of counseling and discussion with the patient. Hello? Yes, sir. Uh, that's very well answered. I think it cleared all our doubts. And uh, so let's take some other questions. Ankit, do you have time for some more? Uh, yeah, we have uh, time. We have more six minutes, six minutes with us. I think there are some few questions you can take up, uh, Dr. Nathan, from the chat uh, box. Yeah. Yeah. Can you read out some questions? Like uh, we'll ask uh, Dr. Ali to maybe. So they want to know about the uh, uh, stimulus of the current, which uh, is used for the cortical and the subcortical uh, structures. Dr. Ali, if you can comment on that. Okay. Uh, so you mean the direct relation monopolar? Yeah. So, so uh, when we use mono. Sorry, you were saying something. Yeah, uh, I think the first question that many people would have is when will you choose a monopolar stimulator and when will you choose a bipolar? That's a, probably a common question that people ask. So maybe you can answer that. So if you're doing if you're doing the patient awake, it's very simple. It has to be bipolar. So mm -hmm. uh, okay, let's 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 uh, uh, make it a little uh, more um, focused on motor. Now assume that you want to only map and monitor motor areas. So uh, if you have MEP recording facilities and uh, you are operating only in the region of the periorolandic area, you're not concerned about any of the other functions, 
that I would do that under anesthesia with MEPs and with uh, motor cortex mapping and monitoring, especially if it is on the non-dominant hemisphere. If it is in the dominant hemisphere, that is it's on the left side for most of the patients, and you are going to be uh, interested in uh, mapping even the speech function and a lot of the executive functions, which are more on the dominant side, then you would keep the patient awake. And I would operate most patients with frontal tumors, perirolandic on the dominant side awake. So for non-dominant uh, tumors in the frontal, you can operate them under anesthesia with MAP monitoring and direct cortical stimulation. When I'm doing the patient awake, I will use bipolar stimulation. When you use bipolar stimulation, it means a modified Penfield stimulation with a bipolar uh, probe. And when you're doing it awake, we will use a monopolar probe and use a train of stimulus, which is a train of four or five, which is uh, the way to do it under anesthesia. Some people also do motor mapping uh, under anesthesia with the bipolar. It can be done. It can be done, but the level of uh, the intensity of the stimulus that you need for bipolar under anesthesia is much higher than under awake, and that induces a lot more seizures than the monopolar technique, and therefore may be unsafe. Okay. Um, one more question is, sir, uh, do you monitor uh, after discharges, like for seizure, uh, I mean, to prevent seizures, do you do that? So it's a very good question. I don't do that routinely. We do that in some cases. But uh, it is uh, advisable and preferable if you do that, especially if you are doing bipolar. In uh, monopolar, uh, it's not that much of a problem. But as I said, bipolar can have a higher risk of causing seizures. And therefore, uh, it's always advisable to do after discharge monitoring. Another reason to do after discharge monitoring in uh, uh, bipolar stimulation, especially in awake patients, is that you want to differentiate whether the deficit that you are getting when you stimulate is because of the stimulation and not because of a subclinical seizure. And that is, uh, that is the way to differentiate it, that is to pick up the after discharge. But when you do after discharge monitoring, you have to be careful that you have to pick up after discharges in the vicinity of your stimulation and not somewhere remote because that will not help you differentiate this then. So uh, there are uh, some more technical nuances to that. But yes, after discharge monitoring is advisable and you should be doing it uh, in the right way, especially when you're doing bipolar stimulation. Okay. Uh, there's one more question about uh, MEP monitoring in pediatric patients. Like uh, in your experience, what is the minimum age that you have used uh, motor revoke potentials on for pediatric? Uh, so, um, uh, in our group, um, my colleague, Dr. Prakash Shetty, has, uh, he does a lot of the pediatric and uh, uh, he has uh, actually analyzed this data. We've used it, the youngest in, uh, I think it's uh, around the three years or um, two and a half or three year old child, the MEP monitoring and MEP stimulation. Okay. And uh, uh, between three and 10, we've used in quite a few patients, yeah. yeah. So I, the, problem, the, the, yeah. the challenge, the challenge is that uh, if you're going to use it for transcranials, you need much higher stimulus uh, intensities yes. because of the lack of myelination. And uh, it may not be as um, uh, linear a rule as you have in adults. So you have to be a little careful. Yes, the physiological differences and the myelination uh, has a lot of issues with pediatric. And one more last question, sir. Uh, uh, insular lesions, like what would you monitor and how would you go about for a typical insular glioma. Okay, so again, if it's dominant or non-dominant, if it was dominant hemisphere insular glioma, I would do that awake generally because I want to uh, look for functions in the opercular area. I, I, I do a combination of transcellular and transopercular, so that's why I would map the patient awake to look for speech areas and also map um, uh, the motor areas by bipolar. In insulas, it's also possible, even with awake, to do MEP monitoring uh, using the strip and a, a modified uh, monopolar train uh, paradigm. We've done that occasionally, but not routinely. In the non-dominant side in insula, I would do a strip MEP. I would do transcranial MEPs. I will do a strip MEP. And uh, there is no role for a direct uh, motor stimulation or mapping. But yes, subcortical mapping is important because once you reach the depth of the insula, once you've gone beyond the external capsule, 
then you might start getting motor responses, especially in the inferior limiting sulcus, there you would get motor responses. Okay. Wonderful, sir. Uh, it was a wonderful lecture and uh, we thoroughly enjoyed uh, your lecture and uh, it opened us, opened our, opened our minds for, uh, you know, uh, to improving ourselves and a uh, lot of information. So congratulations. Thank you very much for the wonderful lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think Ankit, thank we you. can... Thank you so much, sir. Yeah. So, uh, am I audible, Dr. Nathan? Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nathan. I think we also have uh, with us a uh, very senior neurosurgeon, Dr. Dev Pujari. Can I please ask, sir, to uh, give some comments? Can I invite him for some comments? Sure. Turkan, can you unmute, sir? Yes, sir. Yeah. I think he's not audible. He's not unmuted. Uh, he's not unmuted. Turkan, can you... Is that... Am I audible yeah. now? Huh, yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, I think it was a very uh, nice presentation. And uh, as Nitin described, I think uh, you have explained it very nicely. I actually had this only one question. How young a patient you have uh, used the uh, mapping... Uh, uh, especially the motor uh, and supplemental motor mapping, I think you have just answered that. So uh, altogether a very nice experience. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, thank you, sir. Um, I think we, uh, we can move on to the next presentation, uh, which is by Dr. Shibu Pillay. Um, sir, I request you to please share your screen.